This morning, the title of my message is The Power of Delight in God's Word. The Power of Delight in God's Word. And Pastor Kerry has been preaching on uh, the life of being born again. You know, we're saved. We're saved and we're brought out of darkness and put into light. But there is a life then that is lived as a born again in the spirit person. And this, this life has all kinds of things that God has given to us. And there's four questions that I want to ask, and I will answer, four questions to ask and to answer this morning to look at delighting ourselves in God's Word, in God and in His Word. As we live this born-again life, you know, what is truly set before us? What do we have that's, that's here? Yeah, what, what is God saving us to? He didn't just save us from. He did save us from. Thank God he saved us from. He saved me from myself. But he saved us from darkness. He saved us from the rule of sin and death. He saved us from. But what did he save us to? Right? Okay, so I lost my voice this morning, getting so excited in the spirit. Um, but Lord, I thank you that you're giving me my voice back right now. That, that your spirit gives me utterance to speak as I need to speak. So what has God given us or what has he set before us in this born a new life? This incredible life. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you might have life. And that life, a little bit. That life abundantly. Play ra'u, overflowing. It's abundant, this, this life that he's come to give us. So I set before you, and the answer that I, I, I'm going to choose to focus in on today, what does he set before us? He set, he set before us the choice of delighting in the Lord. Delighting in the Lord and delighting in his word. That we have a choice that God, as he brought them to the, uh, the promised land, and they were about to go in, in Deuteronomy 30, he says, I set before you, he's speaking through Moses, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you would live. That he sets before us this life, this life just to be lived, okay, however we want? No. This life to enjoy him. This life to delight ourselves in him and in his kingdom. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, wherever you go, I want you to say this. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Amen. To take authority over the dead or cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead. Yes. Tell them the kingdom of God has come upon them. This is God's kingdom. This is unlike any other kingdom. That this is what's been set before you in Numbers 13. And I love this. Uh, in Numbers 13, uh, we have when God delivers Israel out of Egypt, right? They come into the wilderness. And, and God gives them the law. And they're, they're in the wilderness here. And then they move towards the promised land. And they decide to send out spies, and, and God tells them, I want you to send out, and they're not just spies, but they are, they're leaders of tribes, leaders of tribes. And I want you to take all these leaders, I want those leaders, and I want you to send them into this land that I'm giving you. And I want you to spy, I want you to check out this land and see what it's like. See, see if it's fruitful. See what inhabitants are there. I want you to check it out. So the spies, they go, and they look at this land, and they come back with a report of what was in the land. And not only did they come back with a report, but they came back with grapes hanging off of two guys carrying them, you know, just, just these huge grapes and this great fruit from the land. And so they see this demonstration of this great fruitful land. But 10 of the spies could only see 
the inhabitants of the land. Yeah. And they were overwhelmed with these inhabitants. And they're, they're sons of the, the Nephilim. Yeah. They're like Goliaths in the land. And how could we possibly defeat these people? We're as grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so they have this report. And this report is filled with fear. Yeah. Well, thankfully, there was two that went that did not have that perspective. And we see in Numbers 14 that, you know, they're, they're grumbling about this and they're saying, oh, I wish we would have just died in Egypt. Or I wish we would have just died out here. He said, it would have been better for us just to go back to Egypt now. So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and we will return to Egypt. In verse 5 it says, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of Israel. Moses and Aaron fall down. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to spy out was exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. They're, or our, the word is food. We will be nourished by what's already there in the land. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said, oh, just stone these guys. They don't know what they're talking about. I set before you. <laughs> this is, this is the, the thing that he's giving us, the picture. I set before you this great promised land. So now we recognize this as a history of Israel. But don't we also see it as a, a picture of our own birthing experience in the kingdom of God that we are brought into. I have set before you this great kingdom and that when you come into this kingdom, there might be things that you're, you can be afraid of, but be of good cheer, I have overcome. I have overcome and you will walk in every good thing that I have purposed for you to walk in as you trust in me. And this is what he's telling them. But as, as I was thinking on this experience, right, I just hear the Apostle Paul being transported in time back to this exchange, right? I, I hear him being put back into this exchange. And it says in 2 Corinthians, Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, <clears throat> like, like he's like extending what Joshua and Caleb would be saying. Like Paul then says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't war according to flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying, reasoning, thinking, every lofty thing that raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. Right? I, I love this passage because I just, I see this. I, I know this didn't happen, but I know that the Spirit that these words came from was standing right there when Joshua and Caleb were making this statement. Right. They were saying, don't get into fear. Take captive those thoughts. Don't let those thoughts of fear hinder us from going in to what God has purposed for us to step into, right? right. Yes. So this is, this is what is happening. And it's what Paul is even saying here in 2 Corinthians 10. And in fact, he's talking to a church who is dismissing him as an apostle. They're like, oh, Paul, I don't know about you. You know, your words are pretty weighty, but you know, your personal, you know, your appearance and the way you speak is just really not that impressive. So we're not really sure you are a true apostle. 
So he says in response to them and their thoughts of who he was, take captive these thoughts. Take captive these things that you're thinking because it's keeping you from a whole host of what God wants to release to you. I mean, and obviously, we have a majority of the New Testament of the Spirit pouring out of Paul that he wanted to give people to hold on to to walk in this incredible born-again life. Right? Does that make sense? So, what is set before us? Really, what's set before us is the choice to delight in the Lord and His Word. That we have to take captive every thought that doesn't, that doesn't come into agreement with that grabbing hold of God's kingdom and delighting in Him. We have to be careful for everything that's trying to crowd or taking our attention off of that. This past uh, two weeks ago, I had an a, a unpleasant uh, experience with a hedge trimmer. Uh, I was he- trimming my crepe myrtles in my backyard, and they just got crazy, and they're all tall, and I was reaching over my fence, and I was trying to get these crepe myrtles, and, the, and they're so high, you know, as I'm cutting them, they're kind of falling all over to the different places, and so as they're falling, I'm kind of grabbing them, and, you know, throwing them off my head, and, you know, picking them and going like this. Well, it, it's a battery-powered uh, hedge trimmer, and I kept my finger on the, and everybody's wincing, oh, no, no. I get, uh, so, nee, 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 <clears throat> right there on my finger. Um, and so it, it definitely did cut it. I, I grabbed it. I, I knew by the sound and the feel that it was bad. Uh, grabbed it, uh, tapped on the door. Well, probably didn't tap. I was kicking on the door. Valerie! You know, and so she... She, we get in the car, go to the emergency, I got some stitches, we, I got a splint because it was actually a broken bone also, it, it went all the way down, broke the bone. Um, yeah, it's a very unpleasant experience. <laughs> I mean, the whole time I was like, oh Lord, you're the healer of trauma. All right, come on, come on Lord, you're the healer of trauma, you know. And uh, anyway, so, and I believe he's a healer. You know, see my little finger today, it's, it's doing good. It's, it's beautiful. There's healing here. Amen? Okay. Um, so, back to my story. So, you know, they gave me lidocaine in my finger, you know, so they can do all their work and all that kind of stuff. Uh, gave me some pain reliever. They were like, okay, yeah, we'll do that. <clears throat> so, come home, go to bed. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Guess what wore off? The lidocaine. And the pain reliever. <laughs> Everything wore off at one time. And here I am in the dark, and it, my, my finger is just like, boom, 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 you know. It feels like it's going to explode. Just this throbbing, like, oh, 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 You know, while I'm, while I'm experiencing this pain, I know you guys, uh, thank you for laughing with me. <laughs> As I'm experiencing this pain, um, all of a sudden I get this thought. And the thought was, it, it, the thought is the picture of me going, Ur! it was the sound, the, just the thing, and it comes to me, and I see the thought, and I start getting sick in my belly, because I'm not only in pain, now I'm thinking on this, but not only does it just come once. Anybody else have this happen to you? Yeah. This is the nature of trauma. Yes. It comes back. Oh, wait, we didn't replay that. Fa- you know, we, we need to replay it again, so you get it again. Oh, wait, let's replay it again. Let's replay it again. Let's replay it again. You know, where do thoughts come from? Your mind, yeah. Where do they come? Well, how do they get there in your mind? Well, some say that it's your subconscious. Some say that it's just learned. Some say, well, we just have no idea where they come from. Um, we do know that there are thoughts that actually come from Satan. Because Peter with zeal, told Jesus, you don't go to the cross, Jesus. No, that's not, that's not your purpose. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Peter. No, he said, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. So, well, either Peter was complete in agreement with Satan, or Satan was giving him, feeding him some understanding that 
that Peter was in agreement with that. Now, thankfully, Peter was restored. Peter, you know, led the church. I mean, there's great things for Peter's life, but we know that thoughts can come from a lot of different places, and it can be learned from trauma. But anyway, I believe that the enemy loves to jump onto things and keep feeding them to us. Hey, you need this. You need to keep feeding, thinking on this one. You need to think on this one. And so that trauma just kept going over and over and over in my mind. And so I, you know, thankfully, as a believer in Christ Jesus, I said, oh, Jesus, my hand. I mean, in my spirit, I'm saying, Jesus, my hand. Jesus, my hand. Jesus, my hand. It's, and as I was saying, Jesus, my hand, I heard Jesus' hands. Jesus' hands. Yeah. Jesus' hands. Yeah. Jesus' hands. And as I heard Jesus' hands, I began to see Jesus' hands spread out yeah. and being nailed on a tree. Yeah. I see him being pierced for me. I, I see him and his affliction up on the cross. And I see Jesus and his hands. And I just keep hearing Jesus' hands, Jesus' hands. And as I'm hearing Jesus' hands, then I hear, or then I see John and Mary, Jesus' mother, standing in front of him. Yes. And I hear Jesus say to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he looks to John and he says, Here is your mother. And I felt the love, the care, the kindness and goodness of Jesus on an excruciating cross, extending kindness and love and compassion and mercy to his mother and to the disciple he loved. Of course, he loved all his disciples. But as I hear him say this, I feel the love of Christ, and I feel his comfort as a tangible thing. And this trauma that was just <laughs> was completely dismantled. And all I could think of was the great love of Christ. Even in the midst of excruciating pain, Jesus was extending this comfort and love and care. And I was undone. And my trauma was undone. Well, Jim, you didn't have any pain? No, I, I had some pain. But you know how it's when you're totally focused on it, it's horrible. But when God takes you away from that and focuses you on something greater, it doesn't mean so much. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And since I was so awake and so overwhelmed, I went and started watching The Chosen. So, <laughs> I don't know if any of you are watching The Chosen, but yeah, that was, it was a good night. It was definitely a good night. I actually watched the Nicodemus Jesus scene. Woo! That was just so good. Woo! My goodness. What does God set before us? He set before us this beautiful delight in him, but we, have, we are the ones who make the choice, Right? We are the ones who make the choice to delight ourselves in him. The second thing is how do we enter in? You know, Moses brings the, the Israelites you know, to the promised land. It says in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 7, Moses ascends Mount Pisgah and views, views the promised land and then teaches Israel the words of God, telling them how they are to enter and prosper into God's land. And this is verse 4. It says, Hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus would say this is the greatest. This is the greatest commandment. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Yeah. What will? These words shall be in your heart. And you shall repeat them diligently. I like this word diligently. It's uh, the Hebrew word shema, and it means, it means to sharpen, but also to pierce. And I get the picture of the words of God that we are using to sharpen and to penetrate. To penetrate uh, just all of the things that 
<clears throat> that want to overcome us or strongholds that would get in our ways. But these words, you shall repeat them diligently, intensively to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Wait, so when are you supposed to do this? A lot, right? And in fact, he says, you know, don't stop there. I want you to bind these on your forehead. <laughs> I want you, you're not going to forget. You'll look in your looking glass or your mirror in the morning and you'll see these bound on your head. And you'll remember these words. And you'll repeat them. You will go over them. You will rehearse them. You will, you will reflect on these words. And these words will help you enter in. Right? This is how you enter in. How you enter in is by delighting yourself in God and his words. Wait, Jim, that's the answer you gave me for the first one. <gasps> ah, yes. yes. You're catching it. Joshua 1.8 says, this is, a, this is so, I just gave you what Moses, what God was saying to Moses and through Moses to Israel. So now, let's fast forward. Moses dies and then God meets with Joshua in Joshua 1.8. It says, okay, now Joshua, you are going to lead these people into the promised land. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, haga, which means to, to moan, to murmur, to ponder, recall, rehearse, reflect. That's kind of my, my, my contemporary understanding of of Haga, which is meditate. Recall, rehearse, reflect. You're going to rehearse on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all according to all that is written in it. For then you will make, whenever God says will, you need to pay attention. He's making promises that God, for you will make your way prosperous and you will achieve success. So I should go on Instagram and Facebook. I will give you what you need to be prosperous. And I can give you this verse. Yeah. This is what God promises. If you do this, you will be successful. Now, oh, and I think sometimes in the kingdom of God, we just think, oh, Jim, yeah, you're just talking about, oh, just, you know, the full heart and all that kind of stuff. You know, if I said, I guarantee you'll make a million dollars if you do this, <laughs> would you pay attention? You would. You would be, oh, wait, what? Oh, you get, the paper, you get paper out, you start writing it down. Okay, I need to do this because I want a million dollars. And so I'm going to do this because it's guaranteed. It is guaranteed to make me a million dollars. Now, you would do that if you were going to get a million dollars. Is the kingdom of God greater or less than a million dollars? I know, you're saying, yeah, I know, it's greater, yeah. <laughs> it is so much greater. Yeah. Grace that is greater. Grace that goes on top of grace, that never stops, that's, that is given without measure, that continues to go on for eternity, for eternity. That he's saying, if you grab hold of these words, you will be prosperous and you will have success on this earth and the one to come. I was listening to a podcast uh, a couple days ago, and her name is Rachel Gilson. Uh, she ministers in a bunch of different places. But she tells the story of how uh, she went to college. She went, I, I think, I believe she went, had a scholarship to Yale. Smart lady. But at the time she went to Yale, she was an atheist with same-sex attraction. And she began to go through all her courses, and one of the courses with philosophy, and went through, you know, learning about Descartes, and Descartes' proof of the existence of God. And she was seeing how Descartes' proof of the existence of God just didn't even make sense to her. You know, Descartes, one of the proofs was, I think, therefore, I am. Remember, that's yes. Descartes? Yes. Okay, so she's, she's going through these classes, and she said, you know, that's just a joke. 
this proof, this doesn't prove anything. But it made her think, what, what if there are some convincing proofs? <laughs> and she had a friend, <clears throat> and I can't remember if it was a girlfriend or not, but she had a friend at school, and she was at her place, and the, the lady was a Christian. And, well, at least she was a Christ, or she, she believed she was a Christian. Anyway. <clears throat> so she went to her house, she was looking at her books that were on her shelf, and she saw a book that said Mere Christianity. She was curious. So she pulled, pulled the book off the shelf, but she didn't tell her friend. And she says later, I just kind of actually just stole the book. Because <laughs> I didn't want to tell her that I was interested in, in discovering more about this Christianity stuff. So she, took, she takes the book, and she is convinced with the existence of God after she reads the book. It, it is a great book. C.S. Lewis did a wonderful job on a number of different arguments for proving the existence of God. Anyway, she, she is convinced of the existence of God. And then that just led her to, wait a second, if there really is a God, then he definitely wants to connect with his people, I believe. And so it led her to go to a church or a, a campus ministry and that, that's where she grabbed hold of Jesus and the Bible, and she trusted in Christ. And she tells this story of how the Bible was her anchor to really experience who Jesus was. And she just saw the, the beauty of the Bible. And just didn't see it as a book of, just, just any regular book, but really saw it as God's word. And she stayed connected to this group of believers, and she stayed connected into the Bible. Uh, but she still had her same-sex desires. And she was struggling with them because she knew that really wasn't in the Bible. And she had some other Christians that were telling her, well, you know, you can, you can you know, believe Christ, and you can still you know, have your same-sex attractions, but as she brought them, she kept trying to bring them together, she realized it wasn't consistent with Scripture. And she realized, you know, a lot of people were just saying, well, you just say no. You just say no to your same-sex attraction. And she says this, you know, you can't only say no, says Rachel Gilson. You have to say yes. Yes to Christ, the only strength I know. She talks, the title of her podcast is How Jesus Helps Me Say No to My Same-Sex Desires. Well, he's just a big meanie. No? She began to realize that as long as I press into Christ, he gives me greater and greater understanding. And greater, greater resolve and strength. And it's just this incredible testimony of this atheist coming, this you know, same-sex attracted atheist coming to Christ and grabbing hold of Jesus and not letting go. I just love the testimony. And, and I was thankful to have heard it. Um, as a parenthetical, she is married and she has a seven-year-old daughter. God is in the saving business. Yes, he, is. he wants us all to come into his embrace. How do we, so I said, so, uh, so what's set before us? You know, what, uh, I guess I need to look at my questions again. Okay, so what's set before us? How do we enter in, this is the third question, how do we put it into practice? How do we put it into practice? Delight yourself in God and his word. Wait, that was the answer to one and two. Yes, this is the answer to three. Delight yourself in God and his word. The action of it. Put yourself in that place. You choose continually to delight in him. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Woo! David knew how to delight himself in the Lord. I love the Psalms. The Psalms are such a great resource to us. <laughs> if I could find it. Okay, Psalms, middle of the book. Here we go. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. David, David kind of just sets us out. 
with the choices. Okay, here's the choices. Right? What's set before you? How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Is it your choice? Yes. It is your choice. Doesn't stand in the path of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law, the Torah, which is instruction. Instruction, giving direction. This is what Torah means. He is, delights himself in the instructions, in the words, in the law of God. The law of the Lord and in his law, what does he do? He meditates day and night because he delights himself in the Lord so much that meditation is something that just comes naturally to him because he can't help but think of the one in whom his soul delights. Isn't that what he's saying? And then it gets better. <laughs> so I'm going to delight myself. I'm going to be in this place of delight with the Lord. And then he says, And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever, in whatever he does, he prospers. Wow. Wow. It's because of this person who continually delights himself in God and his word. That this is the promise that God makes to us. And in fact, Jeremiah even picked it up and he begins to say the same thing that David was saying. He says, not only are you like this tree, but even when famine comes and there is no water, that this tree still produces fruit. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremiah. Yes, you will, you will have it in abundance. Yeah, so good. That he delights himself by meditating on the Lord. What is meditating again? Remember, I use this example, chewing on the cud. Yeah. Chewing on the cud. You know, and in fact, I looked it up again. I wanted to keep, I keep looking up this chewing of the cud thing. Uh, you know, it's, cows don't have a number of stomachs. They have one stomach. They have four chambers. Now, the chambers are, you know, they have a first chamber, and I don't remember all the names of the chambers. The first chamber is where, you know, that comes, whoop, whoop, you know, come back and forth, and then it just keeps working through uh, to really get where it needs to go. But it's the chewing of the cud that allows it to get into the farther chambers, yeah. right? Do you digest it more and more? Way more than I wanted to know about chewing the cud, right? Okay. <laughs> But it helps me in my, my mind about this, though, that the Lord wants us to chew on these things, to chew on his, not things, but chew on the word that he has given that's living and active. And that we need to intentionally, you know, because we are delighting. And it's not, and, and that's why I'm saying delight. Delight is such a key for this. It's such a key for us coming into the things of God. Because we do what we enjoy, right? Yes. We do what we enjoy. Well, so I suggest to you, enjoy the Lord. <laughs> enjoy the Bible more and more. Intentionally enjoy His Word throughout your day. And that's how God was saying, this is how you're going to come into the promised land. It's how you are going to be successful because you are carrying my words on the inside and you keep chewing on these things and it's changing you and it's making you more into my image, who I am. You're going to carry my heart and my desire. So when things happen that you have this resource to grab from. Okay. So how do we put it into practice? Delight ourselves in the Lord. Intentionally, taking control of our thoughts. You know, and four times a day is great. You know what these four times a day? You know, he's really pointing to uh, when your mind is unoccupied. You know, Proverbs says idle hands are the devil's you know, workshop. But, you know, unoccupied minds are really attractive to the devil. When we don't occupy our minds with something, it will be filled with something else. The enemy wants to occupy your mind, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And in fact, does he come and just, just destroy you? Why doesn't he just come and just whack us all? Just kill us right away. 
It's not his plan. In fact, he wants to occupy my mind so that I will help maybe occupy somebody else's mind with the evil that he's put in my mind. Right? That's what he wants to do. He wants to occupy. So we need to take control of who's occupying this place here, this gray matter. That we take control by choosing to delight ourselves in the Lord. A, a, I'm going I'm to enjoy something in the kingdom of God, and I'm going to take authority while I'm doing it. I'm going to push back the enemy. Delight yourself in these thoughts. Um, I'm going to do this demonstration. I've got to do it quick. Okay. I'm going to turn. I'm going to ask you to put, uh, put the guy, if the guys could put up Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. And this is, this is where Paul, you know, Paul, Paul says take captive every thought. But then in Philippians, he's telling us how to live, how to operate in this born again kingdom. And he tells us, you know, you need to rejoice always. You need to pray. If you're anxious in anything, you know, with everything, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God. You know, he's, he's telling us a, way, a whole bunch of ways to live rightly in the kingdom. And then he says, now think on these things. Actually, he gives you a whole list. And he says, think, but the word is logizomai, and it means the state of reasoning, yes. the state of pondering, going over something. Recall. Rehearse, reflect that this meditation, this, these things I give you so that you can meditate on them. And so now if I could have some volunteers, I need some volunteers now. Just come on up. Come on up. I mean, volunteers over here and then I need volunteers over here. So it's working out. Okay. And so I only need four on this side. Four on this side and I need five on that side. So kind of just, here, come on up, like right here, and then, then you can be here, right back here, and then here. Everybody's got to see your pretty face, though. And then I got number five. All right. Okay. Everybody's got two. Four on this side, five on this side. Okay. And just hold them like this. Like this. And you can just hold them. Yeah. You can just hold the two. You're each going to have two, okay? You would just hold them like this. You have to kind of separate a little bit so you, we can actually see the signs. Okay, so here we get this list from Paul in Philippians 4, 8 through 9. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think, think, meditate, the King James says, meditate on these things. As for these things that you have learned and received and heard from me, put them into practice. Practice. Put these things into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Wait. And then Paul also says in 1619, Romans 1619, and the God of peace who what? Crushes Satan underneath my feet. Be As you practice this thing, you crush Satan underneath your feet. Okay. So I'm getting excited about this. So, so can you guys see... These are, the, these are the words from Philippians that we've been given. Yes. So, right? So, this is a picture of your mind. What has been given to you. So, you got these things in your mind. What were we talking about? You know, some things come into your mind, and you're just not even sure how it got there. So, so trauma came into my mind, right? Well, I, I love this word true, alethes. This word true is undeniable reality. Isn't that good? Yes. I mean, it's truth, but it's undeniable reality. Oh, right. Okay. I will take that one. Let's bring undeniable reality in here. What did it do? Yeah, it just totally blocked trauma, right? Yes. It, tra- it blocked trauma right out of the way. Well, Well, what about... Fear and worry. Fear. Well then, honor, honorable, being honorable, which honorable is seeing things with awe and wonder. Not seeing things in fear. So then when fear starts to come, when fear starts to flood, I go to somebody, I go to someone who is worthy of all honor. 
And I look to him, and it just pushes out the fear and the worry. It is something greater for me to hold on to. Okay, now you guys can shift back. Okay. So, so then I have shame and regret. Shame and regret comes in, and I have pure. The word, the word pure is clean and right, things that are good. And that as I, I think of just me being in shame and regret, then I can go to Christ who makes me pure. That I am holy because he is holy. And that he has given me, he didn't even, he was not just holiness for himself, he actually was holiness to give me holiness. And so, so that purity comes to begin to wash away the shame. Because I, I look at him, but then I see myself through Christ. Good. Temptation and lust. We were just talking about uh, Miss Gilson. Yes. That we, we think on temptation. And, you know, we're tempted with all kinds of things. We, she, she said, I go to Christ. Yeah. I go into the word. I look to him who is my strength, who is and knows all that is right. And I focus on what is right. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? I've hidden it in my heart. I've meditated on it in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Yes. That right comes and it shoves out all of these things. Right? Okay. Thank you. So, hate and bitterness. And, uh, oh, I don't hate anyone. Jesus says, if you even said like you're stupid or foolish, yeah, yeah. that that's where that comes from. Yes. That hate and bitterness uh, can hit us, especially if something happened or somebody did something wrong to us. And we're supposed to think on things that are admirable, things that have good report, yeah. things that, I, that are, are good to think of. And that as I think of things that are admirable, things that have a good report, that I... Actually, that's for the offenses. No, hate and bitterness was lovely. Because the lovely is pros phileo, which means, uh, which means like a brotherly love, going into brotherly love. It means lovable. Think on things when hate comes and bitterness comes. Think on things that are lovable. Think on things that are filled with love that I choose to push that aside. And then with offenses and unforgiveness, then I think of things that are of good report. I can think of things that are evil about a person. But you know, when I think about someone and I want to dwell on how bad they are, I just think about the evil that was, they, were, they did or something. But God wants us to think of how to bless them. We have a, a pastor that has written a book on blessing. We bless instead of curse. And so we come into that place of thinking of good things about that person and how God sees that person. The good report that he desires for them. Okay, so push back. All right. So let me make sure I get these right, okay? Okay, okay. So loneliness and depression. And we can get into these. We can feel all alone. But the, the excellence... He uses the word, uh, in, Peter uses the word, you know, we, we declare the excellencies of Christ. That he is with us and he has given us everything that we need. So we, we bring in the excellencies of Christ and the one who is excellent in loving and how he will never leave me or forsake me. And that he helps me in those places that I will hold you by the hand. I will lead you by the hand. I will make known my joy and my peace to you. That the excellencies of Jesus just begin to, to flush out the loneliness because I know that he is so for me. And then jealousy and selfish ambition. James says, where there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is confusion and every evil thing. He's talking about the testimony of the devil, really. Think on what's praiseworthy. What is praiseworthy? What is worthy of our praise? Jesus is worthy of our praise. Okay, okay. So now, can I have 
the goodies over here. Yeah, you goodies all over here. And then all the baddies over here. I'm not good. <laughs> Just for the sake of this demonstration. Okay, they're all good, but I... I just for the sake of this demonstration. Okay, now, it's okay. You don't have to stand in quite a line. Just kind of gather up kind of close. Real close. Okay. Now, flip yours around. Okay. So now, when you think on Jesus, he fulfills every one of these wonderful words. When you think on Jesus... Jesus, he comes, and now I want you guys to come up right around Jesus. <laughs> you think on Jesus. You bring Jesus to a, a, one of these places. What happens? You bring all of these. You bring all of these with you. Isn't that right? This is what's happening in us when we meditate and we delight ourselves in God and in His words. That it, it pushes out, it crowds out what the enemy, what our past, what the world, all the other things that want to, to, want to control our minds. That we take captive these thoughts by these things. That makes sense? Yes. Get this picture, okay? You are in charge of this. Yes. Yes. You are in control of all of this. So when we recognize, oh man, this word is truly living and active. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to, to get in deep to where it needs to go. This is the truth of God's word. Yes. Okay, you guys, thank you so much. Yes. Amen. I'll give a great hand of applause. Okay, should I give you one last point? What are, what are, what, what are our resources? What are our resources? Jesus. Delighting ourselves in the Lord, right? Yes. Delighting ourselves in the Lord and in His Word. This is our resource. And these, these resources are in four anchors. And I just need four. Yeah, you guys can just come on up. Just right here, real quick. Four resources that, that are anchors that we have in this meditation that God has given us. This, this meditation that we have throughout the day. So we have His Word, right? We've been talking about it. We have His Word. But... Thank God this is not just an activity that happens outside in a vacuum somewhere, but it actually happens in God's presence. That God's presence is with me while I'm doing this. That's awesome to think on. And we can even, uh, I want to actually go in one more step with this whole meditation preaching series. Um, and we'll get into this again. But God's presence is with us as we meditate. And not only is His presence with us, which, well, yeah, God's Spirit, God's presence. Uh, what I want to say about God's Spirit is that we have the Spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. We have the person of the Holy Spirit who walks beside us and is waiting for us to meditate on God's Word, and He's going to guide us in our meditation. So when I was thinking of Jesus and his hands, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> pops John and Mary sitting there watching Jesus. I believe that was illumination by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. That was the Holy Spirit just, just breathing into what I was meditating on. That we've been given the Word, God's presence, God's Spirit, and God's love. Amen. Delight yourself. Delight. We need to delight ourselves in God's love. Let us take pleasure in the Lord. That in His right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Does that sound good? Yes. 
That's, that's what God has come to give to us. You guys can sit down. Thank you. That these are resources that God has given to us to walk in his kingdom. That there is this one story. I've got to tell you this story. This is so good. Um, and it was by Bruce Thielman. I don't know if you, anybody's heard of him. He's pastor of Pentecostal, the, sorry, Presbyterian Church uh, in Pennsylvania in the 1900s. And he tells the story of this woman who was in a mental sanitarium in California. She'd been there for years. She didn't speak to anyone. No one. She would go and she would sit on this one bench every day and she would just sit there in almost a catatonic state. A new doctor came and he came over to her and he said, hi, what's your name? Well, my name is Dr. Heaven. H-E-V-E-N. Heaven. Dr. Heaven. Nice to meet you. He says, you know, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. He kind of talked to her a little bit more. He's like, I will see you tomorrow. But again, my name is Dr. Heaven. H-E-V-E-N. As he starts to walk away, this lady on her chair, on her bench, she looks up, which he didn't realize. It was totally dramatic and out of character. And she says, what was your name? He said, Dr. Heaven, H-E-V-E-N. She tells later the story of what happened to her that when he said heaven, she began to think of heaven. And as she began to think of heaven, then things began to start flooding into her. The next day, she said, she went around the hospital, the sanitarium, and she began saying, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And every person heard that multiple times during that day. The next day, she said, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. And she just kept saying it, saying it, saying it, saying it, saying it. At the end of six days, she was saying, with man, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Yeah. Two weeks later, she was released from the sanitarium. She has been a teacher, a leading teacher in California for the last 14 Woo. years. Woo. <laughs> It's the power of our delight in the Lord and in his words. That there is this great place that we have just to be in him, to, to experience and to walk in this kingdom. And I just want us to all recognize the power that is available to us in this place of meditation and taking captive every thought. And the more that we do this, the more that, that good thoughts just begin to permeate and come forth from us. Whoo, you guys with me? Yes. All right. Yes. I want to do one more thing, and if you need to go, you can go. The sermon is over. Done. It's in the books. Done. You're all done. Okay, you can leave. Sermon's done. You can leave. I would like, and I'm asking if the worship team would come up, and I want to sing this sound, song, and I, I know you guys have heard this before. Uh, the song is Graves to Gardens. <clears throat> But I want us to think on this song. As, you, as we sing this song, I want us to recognize that he does this in us. He does this in thoughts that the enemy wants to take and he wants to hurt us or destroy us with. But God is, comes, he brings, he brings life and he brings truth and he brings help. The excellencies of him the excellencies of Christ, that he wants to bring those into these places deep within us and that he wants to bring us life and hope and strength and the supernatural and the miraculous and the truth of all that he is, that we share in the divine nature of God. How do we share in that divine nature? By stepping into that delight and enjoying that place. So I want us to, if you want to, I encourage you to, would you stand with me and let's sing this together this morning, just remembering and giving ourselves, Lord, we want to give ourselves to this work, this work 
of meditation and the work of the Spirit in our lives.